We are honored to have Grace Laura here tonight speaking to us. Uh, Grace is principal and co-founder along with her partner, James Dumont, who we also have the privilege of having in the audience tonight. So we said he's going to correct her. He's going to raise his hand and make all the corrections. Um, they're um, co-founders and principals of the architecture firm Law Dalmon. I always wondered, did you think about calling it Dalmon Law, or was it always Law Dalmon? That <laughs> sounded French. <laughs> and then, of course, everyone was disappointed when they realized, oh, she's not right. <laughs> Um, they are an architecture firm based in Milwaukee. Um, Grace is also a professor as of a year or so ago at the Graduate School of Design at, over at Harvard. She's, all, she's held many teaching positions previous to that, including at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where she received the Distinguished Teaching Undergraduate Teaching Award, and also at Syracuse. Um, she's also this, she's coming back home to some degree. She was graduated from the GSD with distinction, where she also won the Clifford Wong Housing Prize, um, and she also went to Harvard undergrad where she studied the yes at the Carpenter Center, yes, in the Carpenter Center. Um, so she's, um, she's also an editor, she's an author, she's author and co-editor of Sky Car City, and she serves along with our esteemed Ivan Ruknik on the editorial <laughs> board of the Journal of Architectural Education. So we are delighted to have her here tonight. She's going to be talking about practice narratives. So thank you for coming. Today. Amanda, thank you so much. And actually, I like this crowd. And it's nice and intimate, so I'm very happy about it. And I know that the weather has been horrible, so um, I'm really delighted to be here. And of course, it's great to see Ivan, because we see each other in DC and elsewhere, so it's great to see each other in Boston. In Boston. Yeah, exactly. Um, I uh, was appointed last year at the same time the chair of the practice platform at the GSD, which is an interesting um, experiment. Um, in that it's a, it's, the idea is that as chair, we would talk about practice issues across a range of our departments, so landscape architecture, urban design, and architecture. Um, and so I've been thinking about practice. And when I, so when I received the invitation um, from Amanda and Ivan about practice, uh, it just, it's, a, it's a subject that's very dear to my heart. And at the moment, you know, we're, trying to, we're, we're having a lot of these conversations with the GSD as well. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Um, I thought that the sort of after the semicolon here, bridge and house, that I might try to find a way of talking about uh, the idea of a binary situation in which basically you're, it's, that word means simply that you're, it's composed of two things. Um, but if you think about the way so the kind of uh, Saussurian oppositional binary concept came about, the idea is more that there are two um, theories set against one another. So for example, it's not, an it's not necessarily a contradictory relationship, but rather a reciprocal one. For example, light and shadow. You don't understand light unless you understand shadow, or shadow uh, doesn't make sense to you unless you have some concept of the notion of light. So that really, the idea is that one cannot understand um, the other uh, w without having the kind of true sense of um, the other condition. So in this, uh, the sort of post-structuralist reading of, of binary opposition would maybe posit that, that, that the ideas are more interrelated and interdependent. And so in this way, I like to think about bridge and house maybe as binary stars. Um, Binary stars are a system of two stars that revolve around each other uh, under their own mutual gravitational um, system. So if we look at this image of Katsura, in this sense, it's, the idea here is that these stones are positioned to the, relative to the human gait, and they're shaped to emphasize the stone's weight and hardness, but it's in simple opposition to the fluidity of the water. So the in, this interrelationship encourages the user to look down and appreciate the reflection of the sky in the water. So it's a poignant moment of human engagement with matter woven into the natural landscape. And then these stone graves, which describe another kind of binary opposition, solid and void, as a reciprocity of form, matter, but also then the human body. So the emphasis on the morbid concavity the reclining figure that delineates space over object and equilibrating solid and void. So clearly, this is carrying a kind of social meaning um, and the need about our need and the sort of implication of our humanity. So 
again, trying to think about this in terms of the question of practice, um, at La Dolman, we've been engaged in a huge range of projects that require us to call into question assumption, uh, assumptions about architecture's binaries or the, the divisions, the parts of the discipline and the limits and boundaries that we must integrate for contemporary practice. Um, and these would enable us to produce work that spans across type, constituencies, modes, and heterogeneous collaborators. So here's a list of some of our recent work, the typological variation of which requires a, a reimagination of the kind of gravitational field of what we do in order to respond. So you can see that you know, it's uh, almost bordering on a kind of ADD. Um, and I in terms of the question of, of practice, we have to match this diversity with the strategy, with a strategy for the pace of the practice in order to manage projects which have significantly different time scales and intensities. So the way that this works for our uh, practice is that civic infrastructure projects form the bottom, the baseline of the office, you know, let's say here. Um, and these are incremental. They are requiring patience. They're elusive, amorphous in, inten in intention. And these are contrasted against the melody, the red, of uh, building projects that are, let's say, more definitive or, or have more programmatic clarity. And then, uh, again, contrasted against the staccato of competitions and exhibitions, which are speculative, risky, short, and very time consumptive, and completely unprofitable. Um, so thinking about binary stars in terms of their mutuality and interdependency argues for a philosophical underpinning of practice and a, def a definition of practice such that, again, the architect can move fluidly uh, and flexibly across type. Um, so again, I thought today, because again, the call was to talk about, this is very hard to put together, practice, um, and uh, specifically the way in which one practices, I thought I would examine the most seemingly oppositional conditions uh, to examine projects that are obviously different, but also the narratives that make the work cohere. So in other words, um, to discern the gravitational field that binds the work together under a singular authorship, despite the binary context of the work. So I'm basically going to show two projects um, and the beginning of a third, uh, which again has no formal definition. <coughs> as of yet, but interests us a great deal. So it's part of the kind of band of the, of the baseline that um, we're developing. And a lot for us, in our practice, these have been very long in the tooth um, in terms of time. So these two projects have the obvious differences. For example, one is private, one is public. One is small and one is large. One took two and a half years and the other took 12 years. And I had two kids during that time period, too. Um, so again, another is that it's, it's uh, what, pri um, for the family or for the city. One was managed through a construction management process. The other was a competitive bid. One is by the lake, and the other is over a river. Um, one is within a very typical residential neighborhood, and the other is within a terrain vague. So what do they share in common? Interestingly, they were both produced by a team of three people in the office. Um, and their, incidentally, as I was preparing for this, I noticed that their cost per square foot was exactly the same. Hmm. Um, maybe not so smart in business terms. Um, but then also, I was thinking that philosophically, what is the thing that underpins these projects as a kind of shared narrative? And we would say that ma matter underpins the visceral and tectonic concerns that emerge in the act of making through participation in the culture of construction. Um, and in this case, the matter, the material, is actually the same for both projects in exploration in wood, concrete, and steel. And in many of our projects, we've explored this um, relationship between material capacities, form, and use. As closet functionalists, we've enjoyed designing with standard and non-standard materials at a range of scales, and including hardware, furniture, bathroom fixtures, building envelopes, and cladding. Uh, this happens to be just a door handle um, that is pocketed. It's two-sided so that you can access it from both sides, but with a single aperture within the door. Uh, so in terms of matter, constituting a rereading of the material such that cement board may be as robust 
as slate, or that concrete is made supple, expressive of force, that steel is made velvet, yet forming a crisp edge to the sky, that plastic is folded like paper or origami, or that structural veneer lumber is solid, weighty, and earthen, or that wood could be volumetrically expressive and, and uh, demonstrate the dynamic relationship with landform. So the other concept um, is the notion of terrain. And this concept capitalizes on the latent potential of landform as raw material for architectural expression. Um, in some ways, this is just about the idea of making section. And we're very inspired by how David Le Leatherbarrow positions architecture within the context of time and experience. Um, he suggests that architectural construction may be, be, may be described as an agency of topography's perpetual becoming. I think that's a very beautiful statement. That, uh, so in that sense, terrain embodies the literal exploration of the ground plane and layering of the earth, but also of public civic landscapes and uh, the global scale. So we can think of terrain in two ways. Um, again, the first is the, the literal exploration of the gr ground plane and its restatement in architectural form. Um, and this definitely for us has implied a civic component of our practice, uh, as in this memorial space for civil rights leader Andrew Young. And terrain, the idea amplifies the architect's agency in public space making, asking new questions of architect's expertise education and collaborative opportunities. The second interpretation of terrain involves the terms abstraction, which allows us to imagine expanding the whole of what we might consider. So terrain is global in its aspirations, reinforcing the macro scale of the earth and leveraging non-visual, latent, and contextual conditions that increase the architect's responsibility beyond surficial knowledge. So inherent to this term is a is an openness to engagement with organic systems and expanding the disciplinary boundaries. So in this realm, architects might engage in projects beyond buildings, per se, in a wide range um, of efforts from exhibits um, to infrastructure. And this happens to be an exhibit of the Great Lakes um, in Milwaukee at Discovery World. So these types of work favor a transdisciplinary approach in which architects are empowered to play active roles in expanded modes of practice and in less conventional civil engineering and bridge projects. Um, so this has allowed us to collaborate with municipalities in engineering uh, projects and even with scientists, uh, for example, to compose this kind of a project. So we're, we're, James and I are very attracted to the working concepts of this uh, book produced by Stan Allen, uh, it's, not, it's not actually that new, it's a few years old now, called Landform Buildings. Because the concept reworks the opposition between landscape, buildings, and fields, proposing a kind of protracted interior or expanded notions of the interior. Um, at the same time, it's always easy to be a critic, and I feel like he's missing two points about the idea of the relationship between building um, uh, the potential of uh, buildings which understand a certain kind of idea about terrain. And so the first is simply that landform buildings um, offer the capacity to unearth and leverage non-visual conditions, illuminating the latent contextual conditions, and again, in increasing architects' responsibilities. And then I would add point nine, that landform building amplifies the architect's agency in civic and public space making. Um, and again, this is what will allow us to, to broaden the potential of our of, of what we do in terms of type. So practice, because we've been debating this at the GSD, uh, one definition of it, as defined by my GSD colleague, Jay Wickersham, um, as distinct from professional service and, um, and as distinct from the techniques of the discipline. Uh, for example, the techniques being, you know, do I use Revit, do I use watercolor, do I use a parametric model, et cetera. Practice is, um, so as distinct from those fields, he would propose that practice is about how we engage socially with one another and the impact of that engagement. 
So in other words, the very practice of architecture is defined by the way in which we relate to one another, on how the work is scrambled with other issues for impact. So practice is a social construct. For example, how we interact um, and to whom we communicate and why. So this rings true for us because we know we spend an awful lot of time in communication, um, more so than that we would like. But that um, the discipline is here. Practice is about the relationship of this to this. And so that's a very specific way. And it's, it's actually relatively unpopular uh, at the GSD. Um, uh, but I think that this is a very interesting, and it, um, the opportunity to be here today gives me a real chance to think more deeply about this question, because um, for us, it's at very much at the heart of what we do. And so I, I mean, I'm, uh, I recognize that it actually, we, talk, we think we talk so much about practice, but it really requires us to be much more specific about the definition of practice. Uh, again, because there, there are so many words that we're using to define practice. And in this case, I'm not talking about technique, because I think that's a whole other story of practice. Um, OK. So but there are, for us, there are also two um, very present ideas. Again, w if you keep in mind our, this, let's say, operational, Jay Wickersham's operational uh, definition of practice. Um, and the first is that we see ourselves as cultural disruptors. And that means simply that we are very conscientious about the disruption of the cultural context um, into which architecture is practiced. And I think for, for us, there's a kind of transgressive element that, that works with this. We're striving to create culturally disruptive innovation. Um, and then the second is that we see ourselves as change agents. And this simply means that we are conscientious about ourselves as people who act as catalysts for change. So for us, this means that there are a few key qualities, which again are non-architectural, specific in nature. Um, I was reading a Harvard Business Review article that I thought was actually, you know, I am not an organizational management specialist, business specialist, but I thought that uh, uh, a couple of interesting concepts that emerged from the idea of change agency um, or change agents that that um, one of the most important things is that is this idea of network centrality. And essentially, that's a very fancy way of saying that engaging with people at all levels who wish to exert influence as change agents should be central to all of your informal networks. And I think that that's one of the things that in our practice we strive um, assiduously to do. And the other thing is the shape of the network, the very shape of the way in which you're seeing what your network is. And for us, this is a kind of um, code for cross-training with those in and out of the field in order to yield a kind of cultural intelligence. And then lastly, this idea of character and credibility. Um, now I feel like I'm a minister of something. But, um, but the idea that you are approachable, reliable, patient, yet persistent, focused, yet with an open stance. Um, now, that is not an, absolutely not an excuse for making ugly things. But we do believe that that, that particular uh, character, non-narcissistic trait is very important if you are trying to work in areas outside of, the ver uh, outside of let's say, what is perceived to be the, the um, architecture with a capital A and what, only what we might do as buildings. Um, so again, I'm going to share three projects. Um, and two of these are built. The Greater Together project uh, is completely undefined. So it's, um, it's very underbaked. I'm, um, maybe I'm a little bit embarrassed. I was talking to James earlier. We thought maybe I should just take that out because it's not, it's not, it's not prepared for uh, um, public consumption. But I, I wanted to share a little bit the way in which one begins to formulate that baseline um, and the way in which one thinks about those kinds of projects. OK. So this first project, I, I'm very excited to share this with you because we only recently had it photographed. And I'd like to share the working process of its design. Um, it's sited along a forested bluff edge overlooking Lake Michigan. And this watercolor explores our interpretation of this intimate landscape. It uh, has a grove of aspens and black locust trees. 
And for us, it is the idea of the confluence of the horizontal and the vertical, the oscillation between foreground and background, which, which, which forms a natural framing device. Um, here is the site. The bluff edge itself is, the bluff itself is not stable. And there's a 75-foot mandatory setback line, which is about here, um, from the bluff edge. And so we tried a number of schemes. Some of them, you can imagine, are quite obvious in that you know, this one, for example, tried to position the scheme so that all of, it, all of the, uh, the massing had, had full views um, to the lake. Another scheme, this L-shaped scheme, which detached the garage piece. Another scheme, which was a kind of tower-like form, a single, a single figure um, in, the, in the site. And we all, you know, the clients included rejected this scheme because we all intuited that the tower form would result in a disaggregation of the family. Um, everyone would live on separate floors, separated by the psychological and physical boundary of the stairs required to connect the floors. So though the tower form, at least initially in terms of its massing, was the most compelling formally, um, it would not serve the social landscape of the family, which was at the heart of the project. And so we finally ended with this scheme, which was a way in which we could um, maximize the linear, the already linear shape of the site and create oblique and orthogonal view corridors, uh, but also at the same time keep everything basically on one level within a kind of gentle section. And so this here, the project sits on the flat top bluff, uh, which is actually a common glacial remnant. And here you can see there's Lake, the Lake Michigan. And our response was to emphatically restate the ground plane and allegiance to the plateau, to the shape of the terrain. The house is therefore sandwiched between the earth and the tree canopy, producing tension on the wrapper to connect to this tremendous site, the landscape, the trees, and the view. Which is actually quite a radical departure, a uh, kind of suburban cultural disruption from the sensibilities of the neighborhood and the attitudes for new construction. Um, these buildings were actually built at the same time, and most people thought that, that our project was the, was the uh, construction trailer for the, for the and still people think that. So it's very interesting. So I thought I would share with you the plan diagram uh, just so that we, I could explain how the, um, how the strategy for the for the, um, the space was created. So we started with simple walls, which are like spatial dams claiming the territory. And since the project is driven by views to the site, the walls are thickened and thinned and then split. They're also segmented transversely. And this produces long views to the lake and the entry. And then we overlap that by the transverse view that stitches the interior together and framed views of the exterior. And then special oblique views between, um, between uh, important rooms of the house. For, in this case, for example, the wood shop on the left and the um, kitchen on the right. And then finally, carefully positioned skylight apertures bringing light into the heart of the plan. So the ultimate goal of this cross-grain pattern was a sense of interconnectedness, which enables the social landscape of the family. Uh, so you can see here, oh, my slide got a little messed up here. Um, the plan is organized with two main buildings, the garage and the wood shop on the left, and the house on the right, which creates a patchwork of spaces, interweaving the primary and supporting spaces um, of the house. And so you can see here that the plan is organized with uh, these two main buildings, uh, the two buildings and the garage and the wood shop, uh, which you can see from in this view, I'll show you the actual in which the garage and the, the kitchen actually have these views. And here the, 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 the apertures, the door, the windows, serve as a resolution of our attempt to intersect the different volumes of the house. So, and this again, as you enter into the house, this is, the, this is what you see with the woodshop on the left and the, and the uh, kitchen on the right. Again, this is a view looking from the kitchen window across the breezeway toward the wood shop. 
so as you approach this entry, um, there are apertures that, in the, in the distance, but also from above, again, trying to balance the light source as, and draw you in as you um, walk into the house. And here's one of these skylights washing light down the surface of the concrete wall. If you look at this aperture straight on, um, you see that the aperture from above is allied with both an interior window and windows to the exterior in both directions. So this is, an, again, an idea of engaging the social landscape and the physical landscape. And then moving further into the plan, openings are sliced into the concrete wall releasing a kind of pressure on the wrapper and allowing for connection uh, to the landscape and to the interior rooms of the house. And we did a number of studies um, to design how the, this concrete wall might terminate in a fireplace. And here you can see this concrete wall, the, the fireplace, um, and the way it extends from the interior to the exterior. So these slits or openings within the interior provide that the visual connection um, as, oral, as well as oral between the rooms of the house and amplify the social engagement um, with the family. And the rhythm of these openings forms an expression of, of extension or, or yearning beyond the envelope, creating a sense of this protracted interior. So here is a view of the exterior, and you can see the modulation of the windows um, in the concrete wall, the dimension of which gradually enlarges to dissipate into the landscape. Because the building is very long, uh, it's, ver it's hard to, to show you this. In an, uh, I have to show it to you in an elevation. Um, but our idea was that it would produce a deep horizontal line and a rhythm of porosity, uh, which is, in a way, a suggestion of the kind of mutable or indeterminate um, wall against this vertical backdrop of the forest. So if you, as you make your way around the house, um, you can see the aspen and, the, and all of the bluff of the trees are in back of you now. And we tried to make uh, again, this notion of this protracted in, um, interior that would uh, bring you out into these exterior rooms. And then the scissoring of the walls. Um, I just thought I would share one of those with you um, to demonstrate how the aperture, the idea of this window, is allied with the layering in the plan. So if you note the gap here, uh, zooming into the master bathroom, this layering in the, in the plan produces both long and short views. So apertures in this, it, just in this space alone, are made both in the X, Y, and, and Z planes. Um, there's, a, of course, a skylight from above in that yellow patch. Um, so when you look at the aperture toward the lake views here, you can see um, this is where the split occurs. And um, that is the master master bath. And here that split becomes a programmed boundary layer of the sit spat of the soaking tub. And it's hard to see in this particular view. Um, we had to make a sort of photo montage of it, but it, it shows how the aperture creates threshold and parallax. Here, the, again, the aperture is allied with other interior apertures for borrowed life. But it revealed to us that the strategic position, the very careful placement of uh, these openings can provide a real sense of expansiveness, um, despite the fact that fewer openings in this case in more places could be actually more effective than singular large openings. So as a final moment in the project, um, this is the powder room. The aperture here is treated as a veil in which the private realm is connected to the landscape, yet controlled through its detailing and material composition. And then again here, this yearning for the presence of the lake, a kind of consummation with nature. So 
shifting gears entirely to the idea of, of bridges, um, because I've linked this notion to the question of terrain. In our minds, bridging is an idea of stretching the ground plane over the body of water that you might, or the lake, or um, pulling like taffy that, that uh, terrain to connect both sides. And in the Midwest, in particular where we're from in Milwaukee, this is a particularly interesting condition because the Great Lakes represents about 20% of the Earth's fresh water. So it is a sublime but terrifying landscape. It has a kind of inland sea that has a close glacial history that's actually quite young. Um, and Milwaukee itself, the, the word is derived from the Menominee Indian word of the meeting of waters. So the attributes of Milwaukee are this idea of this post-industrial city, which everyone imagines Milwaukee to be, and it's true, um, it's industrial heritage, which meets this incredible topography, water and extreme climate um, of the Great Lakes watershed. And what you're seeing here in this old mapping um, is all of these different waterways that, uh, that drain into the Lake Michigan. So in this project, uh, this is an existing viaduct, uh, Holton Street Viaduct, built in 1925 that crosses the Milwaukee River. And this is a really ugly set of slides, but I just have to show you because I thought, again, because we are talking about how these kinds of projects could be made. Um, the area surrounding the, um, it's surrounding the neighborhood it was, uh, there were lots of, like many cities, business improvement districts. And the Brady Street area is one of the most pedestrian friendly in the city of Milwaukee. And we worked together with them because they understood that this viaduct uh, and the ability for, for people to simply cross the river at that point would be very meaningful for their businesses. Um, so we conceived of these two projects. Um, one was the bus, uh, a very simple bus shelter, and the other, um, the marsupial bridge and urban plaza. And when you're, when you're dealing with these kinds of civic, very uh, complex inter, um, in infrastructure projects, we also recognized that there would be, there would be um, government agencies with whom um, we would need to work very closely to realize these projects. So for example, in this case, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District happened to own the land upon which the Brady Street bus shelters sit. Yet at the same time, the Milwaukee County system is, is, the, is the owner and, and operator of all of the bus lines. Um, at the same time, in terms of funding, it was privately funded uh, by, was supported by a, uh, a billboard company called Clear Channel Outdoor, um, but also by grants from the Brady Area Foundation for the Arts. And then on the bridge side, all of the bridges in the city are maintained and operated by the Department of Public Works. Um, funding in this came, case came through two different sources. The, uh, the city came up with some matching funds because we were able to successfully write a grant for, the, of, um, for congestion mitigation air quality grant, which is actually a federal grant. And then we worked closely with consultants um, in Wisconsin we were not allowed to hold the contract for a bridge project. And so we, in this case, we had to partner with an engineer who was actually allowed to hold the bridge contract. Um, and then, of course, working together with the Milwaukee Department of Public Works, which would ultimately maintain and, and uh, manage the bridge. And then, of course, because it was federal funding, it came, we had to comply with Wisconsin DOT uh, transportation guidelines, AASHTO guidelines, which are bicycle standard guidelines, neighborhood groups, and of course a tremendous number of adjacent developers. Um, and then lastly, there was a, there's a, another small bit of the project that um, just was completed this past year, which is called the marsupial trestle. It's actually a, a deck that I will share with you as well that just was just recently finished. So when we arrived at the project in 1999, um, there, there wasn't much going on. Um, and this intervention of the Marsupa Bridge is located in a spot in the city with a quite dramatic change uh, in terms of renewed density and habitation. Um, and since the bridge was finished in 2006, and now there are over 500 units of housing on each side of the river. 
Um, the bridge itself was a former bascule bridge, which carried streetcars in the center lane and has a freeway-like quality. Um, there's a kind of space, lost space, beneath this viaduct. And again, the space is owned by the city, which was very ha handy for us because it did not require any easements. But it did require quite a complex negotiation between multiple parties and multiple funding sources, which is essentially you know, present in the need for so many of these um, civic projects. So here's just a section across the site. Um, the project at this point in time uh, consisted of four components. Um, there was the bus shelter, again, right at the corner, which would again mark the presence of the, of the project. There's this media garden, which sits beneath the, um, the space, and it's a, sort of the largest public landing of the bridge. There's the marsupial bridge itself, and then this moon gazing deck that was just recently completed. So, so just to kind of go back to this as a point of departure, um, the crossroads line is the yellow, the yellow, oops, the yellow band at the bottom, and the dark zones in it, this is the bus shelter, and this is the um, bridge in Urban Plaza, and this is the, um, um, the, the trestle. And all of the light yellow in between uh, are the, the moments at which we're fundraising for the project and um, trying to gather the, gather the constituency um, for, for it. So it's, this, is the, this is just an image of the bus shelter. It's a tiny, tiny project. Took about four years to complete. Uh, again, uh, but it was our first project in Milwaukee. And um, to us, it just represented an opportunity to produce an alternative to the standard aluminum bus shelters uh, and the acrylic shelters that, um, that are on most bus corners. Um, it's, again, it's located right in that corner. You can see right there. Um, and it sat in this fashion for actually quite some time. The foundation was poured, and it, then it had to sit there for a while while we again gathered funds and resources to make sure the, the superstructure could be built. There was, this staging was really measured or metered to, to match the funding. Um, and uh, the walls and roof, once we did get that funding, were like dropped in in less than a day. <laughs> Um, just a detail of the, of the roof as, in terms of the way it catches the water. And here, sort of the layers of construction are expressed. So this was our, our way of marking this very small gateway into the project. So as you make your way um, towards the marsupial bridge, this, because you're in an under area, an under bridge zone, it could not be handle it with the, with the traditional vegetation. Um, there's no light or no, uh, no water. And so if we look, this is, again, that you can see the bus shelter. And if we just diagram this a bit, um, here's a, both the river on, on, the, on the left and, the, and Main Street on the right. And from the bus shelter, the goal was to bring uh, the visitor the, or the pedestrian or cyclist uh, across that street. But then we have what's well, very light here, but you can see these, these structural elements that we had to make sure we would avoid. So there, we had to find a way in which you would slip, slide under, uh, um, to the under point of the mid-span of the bridge. And that produced this public space uh, on either side of the path. Uh, into which we positioned these light, light slabs or benches. And so here's the resulting plan. So again, because the, the viaduct overhead limits light and water, we conceived of this space as a kind of moonscape where these light slabs would be floating in gravel. And they would, do, they would do three things. They would provide the seating. They would also provide the lighting um, and the suggestion of a kind of program. And so the result is this inversion of a typical parking lot uh, where the light slabs take the place of automobiles 
and light rises softly from below, washing, the articu um, washing and articulating that structure above as a canopy. And then as a result, very interesting things, film festivals, music performances, regattas, and other riparian events. Um, it has been a tr real catalyst for civic participation. Um, and also even video art installation. Uh, people have got do their wedding <laughs> pictures here. Um, things that we actually, uh, you know, for us, some of the most interesting qualities with, uh, when we saw this space as a, as with the potential for arts investment as a catalyst for that. Um, and dance, in this case, a, a dance company, Wild Space, created a dance that was not at the bridge, but with, but with the bridge. So it was a, the type of space that was beginning to attract artistic investment, which we really um, appreciated. And, and the Lights Labs will be exhibited at the Danish Architecture Center um, in Copenhagen, actually, this month. Um, so in getting to the, to the viaduct itself, the, um, the existing condition of the viaduct, again, it, it, was, it had this sort of space of, of occupation. Uh, there's also an overstructured middle third zone um, right here because the, of street cars, trolley cars that were uh, supported above. So the insertion of the marsupial bridge was, it's not for kangaroos, but just the concept is the idea that the pedestrian bridge would use the viaduct as a kind of host. And so we uh, built this model, uh, it's about eight feet long, and it's just half of the bridge uh, to share with the public what this, that this space existed. Because I, actually for the, for the, for the cognition of, the, of most um, city dwellers, they didn't understand that the bridge was actually, that this space was actually there. Um, there was really no reason to go there. Um, and so we had to share with them the, just this cross section of the bridge, which was actually just ripe for, um, ripe with potential. And so it was important in the, when you looked at the structure of the bridge to eliminate as few members as possible. And so therefore we really needed to find a, a way in which we could meander this pedestrian bridge through the existing structure. And it resulted in this undulate underside. So here you can see the formwork um, for the post-tension concrete. And it resulted in this sculpted underside that celebrates and articulates the support points. It's about 650 feet long, um, so in two directions, and, and it's quite massive and, st and, s and stable because of its concrete uh, structure. We were concerned that, that, that it might transmit vibration, but in fact, the, the, the dead load of the concrete, um, kinesthetically, it again, feels like a stretched terrain or earth. It's very, very stable. And so here's a detail of the point of support as well as the perforated steel uh, panel that, that, that shrouds all of the electrical uh, and veils the in infra infrastructure of the electrical. And we test the, the rail system in several mock-ups. And our idea was that there should be a kind of continuity of the section um, in the cross section. And also important to us was the control of light through, the, through very, very precise framing projectors that we borrowed basically from theater um, in order to cut the light at a very precise angle and not um, um, pollute the riparian landscape below. And here's just a view of the integration of the old and the new. And here, this, this image is interesting because you could begin to see the undulation, which actually also serves to minimize the perceptual distance of this 650 feet in length. Um, it's, it's been quite interesting to see it as a site for recreation and, and the bridge itself also as a catalyst for artistic invest, investment. Here um, Planned Parenthood and filmmaker did, uh, uh, did an event um, on using the bridge and the shape of the bridge to, um, for this artwork. And then lastly, um, this is the last phase of the project, again, just finish, finished last year in terms of its construction. Um, and we nickname it the Moon Gazing Deck. Uh, but it's actually, there's a, just a bit of the old structure left of the Beerline B rail system. 
and we realized that it would give us an opportunity if we could find a way to co-opt it that to get from the bridge down to the lower level. So for example, to connect all of the different bike, bike and hiking paths um, and pedestrian routes if we could utilize this little bit of rail structure. It had a very, very um, slim budget. Uh, but again, the idea was if we could just simply uh, take a relatively standard uh, approach to the construction using stainless steel posts, um, the same kind of perforated panel that you saw on the rail system of the uh, bridge itself, um, bend it to increase its strength. Uh, and then basically copy and flip it. It would produce a very simple pattern, um, which would allow us to uh, control the, the, um, the rail edge. OK, and so here's the project that's, um, again, there's no outcome for this project. It's totally unknown. It's very long in duration. We know we're just at the beginning of it. Um, and it's uh, multiple scales, we think. Um, it, we, we're guessing that, that, uh, that this is the kind of project that takes the similar kind of guerrilla tactics that, that you would require to make your own project, again, which is very similar to the way that the marsupial bridge came about. Um, we were invited to participate in a conference called the Greater Together Challenge. And this is a conference that was intended to create awareness, hope, uh, and ideas to dismantle segregation and address racial and economic inequality in Greater Milwaukee. We feel like this in, uh, embodies a lot of, um, if you don't know where you are going, all roads lead you there. We, <laughs> we, are, we, are, we have to have a little bit of faith that what, um, in, the, in the research and, and quest for this that we will, we will come upon um, some, some interesting ideas. Um, the conference, it was really in response to the very particular racial problems that, are, um, that, that plague Milwaukee. Um, traditionally known for beer and bratwurst, Milwaukee has a, a new national reputation, which is the country's most segregated urban area. Um, a very high percentage of Milwaukee area black students attend hyper-segregated schools, um, and more so than in, in the nation's 25 largest metropolitan <coughs> regions. Um, also, the um, the mass incarceration of uh, the population is really gaining national attention. It's like the new Jim Crow. And segregation based on poverty is a problem. You know, we know that this is all throughout the United States. But in the greater Milwaukee region, the problem is worse than in all other major urban areas. Now, this is just a few of the metrics. There are over a dozen or so metrics. But like Milwaukee is is being rated as number one in all of these horrible metrics that, I mean, horrible conditions. Um, so it's a, it's a very overwhelming and extremely daunting, daunting problem. Um, but when you have this city with so many attributes, not the least of which is water, uh, we began to think about how do we confront the reality of this problem. And um, Eric Fisher uh, produced some very simple diagrams that map uh, segregation, and so we mapped. We we've taken that data and placed it onto our own maps um, to think about this diagram of racial and ethnic um, distribution. And what we see um, is that the city is. So here's Milwaukee. This is the mapping actually by Eric Fisher. Um, but we have to compare our condition to that of other cities just to understand what. Uh, what, it, what, what could it look like? Uh, and you look at something like Portland, and you can see there it's, it's much more um, distributed. It has far more integrated community, high density, and better public transportation, and quite a vibrant economy and cultural scene. 
So just in terms of looking at two different cities, this was interesting to us. And we can identify this sort of disruptive infrastructure that happens to align with the divisions in the city. Um, the old saying, you know, on the other side of the tracks is actually quite real here. Uh, and we know that infrastructure doesn't cause racism. I'm not suggesting that simplistic reading. But racial divisions have become calcified at these edges. And so this is quite interesting to us because also we know that, that uh, to mollify these conditions, we need to develop strategies for some of the failed streets and corridors that in many ways, these are actually large streets in, in, in Milwaukee that have such a poor, poor urban form um, that really they are sites for, for transformation. And so we also know that these highways, uh, which be, are like long linear moats through the city that divide these areas of, um, uh, of, of race, could be stitched across uh, with a kind of different new infrastructure, which again begins to connect both sides. And then also to try to create connections to the lake and public amenities. Um, and also to think about ways in which civic transformations at, at a more localized level uh, within a kind of integrated system might occur. So these are s very systemic large-scale changes, which we intuit could be catalytic um, transformations at a local level. And our thinking is that could we, could we create an entirely new narrative for the city if we start to think of these kinds of um, ways in which we might intervene in the city on a very real, uh, a real uh, problem. Um, and then just to share with you, to close, this is a collage made by a GSD intern in our office a few years ago. Um, and in some ways, it's, it's a kind of idea about design, matter, and terrain. Um, we are searching to excavate uh, how, what, what is this binding agent that, that, that is shared among the different kinds of projects and reflect on and give voice to the cultural disruption and potential for change. Um, we believe that, that if you don't take perceptions for granted and you search for the sort of structure and latent potentials beneath the surface, that ev almost all projects can operate with the idea of, 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 the, of the projects being transformed site within this kind of expansive terrain. Thank you. What did I do for time? Really a great lecture, and now I understand how, how where all the uh, criticism of all of the design pieces comes from in journal or architectural education because none of the articles are ever this clear. <laughs> Just as a as a as a kind of insider <laughs> criticism, uh, a compliment and criticism. But um, one thing I was going to ask, though, I I think that's interesting also for uh, from an educational perspective is so the idea of practice the way you define it I think is a very powerful one the scrambled egg example. And maybe, um, I'm not going to ask what the other side is, is, is but that, that would be my first question of it. Maybe that's a little touchy. But I, but I would ask you, how do you see, since you're talking about it in a pedagogical environment, how do you see teaching practice that way? When, um, and it's something I think we struggle with here too, how do you bring what are very real conditions that architects, that we all know, or at least most architects know, uh, the contingencies that we all deal with and that make architecture richer, that make the scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs. How do you see that? How do you, how do you bring that into the educational environment where we are unfortunately, unlike artists who get to work directly with the painting or whatever, or sculptors, we don't, we don't, we have to simulate that. I mean, how do you, how do you see that? How do you bring that very rich uh, material into the educational environment when it's a simulation? Yeah, that's a very, that's a very interesting, uh, difficult question. So when I, when I arrived at the GSD, I was asked um, first and foremost to have a look at the core curriculum, which is uh, such an interesting, you know, that is a, a pedagogical um, set of initiatives that has been crafted over the last 20 years. Um, and the authorship is extremely um, uh, sound and very well thought in terms of its uh, pedagogical intentions. Um, I was asked specifically to look at second semester, 
which is an interesting time because um, the second semester students are, um, well, first of all, let me just say that the aspiration of the Corps um, is to essentially erase the, the, any discrepancies between those with architecture backgrounds and non-architecture backgrounds, which I think on the, that is an incredible, incredibly ambitious aspiration. At the same time, you know, two years is a very long time for a course when we're lost in the country. Uh, other people do one-year course, one-and-a-half-year course, or even, you know, 0.5-year course. So um, it, it is, it, it's a very long time. But um, the second semester is the moment at which the students are asked to layer into their formal agendas of thinking about site and program. And so for me, this is very exciting because I think, of course, site is the physical condition of the site, but it's the moment at which we could ask ourselves questions about its history, its, um, uh, its, uh, its latent conditions that, have, that, that, that could be very, very broad reaching. And I'm, I've been um, trying to craft uh, the, syllabi to, the syllabus to, to um, work at a certain set of projects which could begin to unearth those kinds of potentials. So the other thing is that um, we've, de we've designed this semester to actually have two different parts, one which is, uh, which is a very urban condition and one which is actually within a park setting, so that there would be this um, contrapuntal relationship between these two at a physical level, but then much more um, um, uh, other readings of the questions of site and also mappings, which I think are very, very, uh, very powerful to create. Um, I think that GIS is a very underutilized um, software, it's so powerful and yet its, its communicative potential is not always understood. And I think this is an interesting moment for, um, for, you know, architecture students have been very preoccupied with certain kinds of software, but one of the most fascinating to me is GIS. Because I think there's things you can do with that that really begin to understand um, uh, ways rereading the city. So, we take a semester like that where there's actually two parts to the semester and, and you're working in two different projects. Um, and you contrast that with what happens later in the, in the core sequence in which students are asked to work collaboratively by the time they're in their fourth semester. And they're asked to do a very large scale urban project that has all these relational issues. And, um, and I, 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 I'm having a difficult time understanding um, in that semester how to bring together a lot of these questions because what we forfeit in that collaborative moment of, of, for the student is we forfeit the students to take more kicks at the can. So we are forfeiting iteration uh, for, for the complexity, and, uh, which I think is very valuable and the collaborative opportunity, but the students aren't give, being given as many opportunities to design certain scenarios, which I think would be extremely useful. So, it's, it's, so it, it's, um, it's unresolved at the moment. And I think that's one of the things that I'm most keen on thinking about is how, what is that progression of core look like? Um, uh, and how do, we, how do we ask of the students the kind of understanding for the sort of social engagements that are really required? Because I actually think that if there's, um, with the amount of communication that James and I do on a daily basis on behalf of our, our projects, remarkably much of that work is, um, uh, is not our design work. And uh, I think that that, but I also think that, that that is part and parcel of the kind of work that we're doing too. Um, and that's not to suggest that one shouldn't actually have a, have, have an, um, a declarative position on the on the project in terms of its of, of in terms of its aesthetic capacity, but I think that it's very um, it's remarkable to me and very sobering to realize how much of the time of the student of, of when you're working is is actually involved in the questions of social engagement and this idea of networked centrality um, that you would find your constituencies and your informal networks. Um, with change agents that could be actually of any age, of any, um, of, of any ethnicity, of multi-generational, that is a very different uh, 
I think, way of thinking than architects who are working exclusively within the context of patronage projects. Um, so we also spend a lot of time not hanging with architects. <laughs> and I th we think that this is really, really important because it's the only way we can ensure a kind of diversity of, of um, so that our cultural absorption is at a broader rate. And that's something, of course, when you're in graduate school and you're focused on just being in graduate school, you don't have that, that same potential. But it's, I think it's so critical that, that we're, we don't only stay within our yoke. Um, and I, you know, again, I think that that's a very, um, it, it's, a, it's a very touchy, touchy-feely kind of thing. There's no, I can't put a metric to it, but I think that, that it, is, um, um, it is essential if, you, if you're trying to actually uh, make change in a, in a um, divergent way. There's sort of non-divergent change and there's divergent change, and if you're trying to make truly divergent change, you, you need to actually have a much broader spectrum and bandwidth for your social engagements. So I don't know if that's <laughs> long and <laughs> probably not quite answering your, your question, but. <laughs> I, so sweet, go ahead. Um, maybe a, a follow on uh, to this and the, and the nature of your practice, uh, you know, it, it, it seems that you have the, as you call them, the patronage projects. Uh, and I understand the level of design in there, the kind of exquisite design in there uh, is, uh, let's say, time consuming or, or let's say, fee consuming. Um, and then I look at the practice of the, the kind of more public work. And, you know, you kind of brushed over the idea of writing a federal grant to, you know, help fund that. And I automatically thought, well, that was a thousand hours right there, I can tell, you know. And then all of the kind of uh, the public meetings and stuff. And then, and then there's the, the teaching, which is a whole other practice. Um, and, uh, and I think a lot of the faculty, you know, nationally, certainly on our faculty, are, are juggling those kinds of, of things as well. I'm just wondering to what level do you and James design that as a, as a way of being? I mean, is this a, are there, are there kind of aspirations uh, to engage both that level of finite, precise design in relationship to the messiness of public, pro, uh, uh, public projects and the kind of speculation of, of pedagogy? Just wondering to what level, um, you know, this is a, a conscious effort or that you have identified potential opportunities and have kind of fallen into them or just curious how that difficult hole works for you guys. It's very speculative on any given day. Uh, it's a constant uh, imbalance of uh, there's nothing to <coughs> about it and there's nothing that can be too premeditated about it, I think, over time. Uh, I actually think it goes a little bit back to your question too. That's, not to not answer your question, but I think on some level, um, one of the binding agents for us is the uh, the interest in the human uh, figure and uh, the body, and so that there's a you know as much as there's an interest in perspectival space or in landscape in the house, there's also very much an interest in that aesthetic sensibility on the bridge. And so um, I think the desire to be engaged in that relationship between the human body, which also can somewhat traverse cultural boundaries in a community or, or bypass certain issues of uh, language um, or upbringing or uh, social status mm -hmm. or what have you, uh, so that being engaged, I mean, part of it is just a desire to be engaged in that relationship in many different ways. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like the logistics of it, which is partly, maybe part of the question, mm -hmm. right, the logistics of that or how we prepare for that, I would say that um, there's, there, there's, you know, we kind of have a plan a five-year plan or a ten-year plan at any given moment, but it has to constantly shift based on where we are, what our other obligations are to teaching or, or um, 
But in terms of, I don't know, I guess it, it, is, it necessarily has to be somewhat uh, in flux mm -hmm. and based on whatever opportunities arise. I think, I think uh, also um, from an ethical position, again, gosh, ethics and don't tell all that I said. Um, um, I, I think it's always been important for us to, to take on projects within the pub public realm. And the minute that you engage in that kind of project, you will know you are in it for a very long haul because most of the public projects are simply not short. So the public and, and or infrastructure related projects, actually we've done a couple of them now. We have, you know, I, I, I tried to provide a snippet um, of this band, but we actually have you know, seven of them going. I've showed three, but we always have these seven things that we're stoking in the fire all the time. But their, their funding streams are very unpredictable. And even when they are predictable, they're extremely protracted. So there's no possibility from the practical side to maintain the practice with those kinds of projects exclusively, nor would we want to, because they don't give you the other kind of need that you, ha that you, that you have um, that's more compact and focused and a kind of deliberate essay in, in you know, the making that a house might provide or something, something at a different scale, um, a building project or you know, <coughs> something that has a different kind of meter and time. So I think that that's absolutely necessary. If you don't have that balance, um, there are other practices that do are, are doing, let's say, exclusively public kind of projects. And what I'd say is that not universally, but generally what they do is that they, they diminish the, um, they, they don't have, because they're trying to do a, men, a number of, and that's, that's exclusively, and they don't have the diversity built into their practices, that as a result, those projects just, they start to look really bad, and they become, the social engagement piece becomes an excuse for, 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 um, for not designing well, or uh, or for not not exercising the other uh, parts of of what it means to be an architect and to be a designer, and so these socially engaged projects are also sometimes code for, you know, nasty, um, poorly designed, ugly things. And I, I don't think that that. So I think that our, you know, it's so fascinating because at the same time that we've been, you know, we have to have this diversity. We have to have a fat baseline and this melody going at the same time. If we, if we didn't, again, I think that, that we would collapse into one zone. And I, I can see why practices do that. Um, at the same time, the other thing that we strive to do is that we believe very strongly that the sensibility for, let's say, material construction and detailing, why should that not be a part of the public realm? And I feel that we've had to be fairly courageous, quite frankly, just to, to dare to say that the public deserves a kind of detailing strategy, the same that you would spend on the $500 square foot per square foot house or $1,000 per square foot house. And that is an interesting, it sounds like, oh, well, that should be OK and easy. But it also, interestingly, has its own backlash, which is that for us, as people who are engaged in the public realm, there are some who would criticize us and, and uh, say that we bring a kind of elitist sensibility or an anti-public sensibility because we actually believe that those projects should be designed and more, and more carefully built. So it's an interesting, uh, you know, we, we feel that that mixture has to occur and yet at the same time the criticism on the, at, at some levels is, well, why can't you just do that public project faster and, and you know, get it out the door and, and why don't we just value engineer the whole thing? And, you know, the reason that the marsupial bridge took more than 12 years is partly because we refused to value engineer. We rather decided to take it in a segmented, linear approach. If this is all we can afford right now, because the other strategy would have been to just design everything, have it built all within three or four years. So you, so you spread the same fee over the entire project. Our strategy was, no, 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 we be patient. Stop. We build what we can within the proper fee that, and, and, and proper um, uh, construction budget that that would allow it to do it well and then wait, and the next segment will come. And wait. Now, again, that means that the, that the process is very long, but it allows us to ensure a kind of um, um, uh, aspiration for the build quality of the project. And I, we thought that that was very important to do, rather than take the approach that we could get it all done within one budget at one time. Um, so, but I, 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 like, for example, the new, the new project for this, for the, the, the racial segregation problems in Milwaukee, I don't know what that's going to result in. 
you know, it, there is no project there. There's just a mapping. And there's a kind of beginning to understand some of the issues and the way in which the city has become calcified at, at particular edges. So that's going to be an ongoing project. I could imagine us, you know, if you invite me back maybe 10 years from, 12 years from now, I might have something to show you. I might. Um, that's how long the kind of marsupial bridge and that kind of project uh, would take. But it's that, it's, and that's a very important from a, from a social engagement perspective, we think that that's, it's really important to tackle that problem because it is, you know, Boston has that problem. I mean, many cities have this problem, and, and um, we need efforts um, um, across the nation, across the world, that look at these kinds of potentials and opportunities. I was just going to add one other bit to your question mm -hmm. uh, in that. I do think that balancing, or as Grace described, you know, kind of following through some of these very long and tooth endeavors, and then working shorter spans of time and more intensive uh, projects, it just it reduces boredom. Right? <laughs> and it, in some ways, I think there's a, a leveling, a financial leveling of where you know, fees might come from, or you know, that you can expend some energy uh, networking or, or strategizing for a project while something else is intensively in design and actually generating some fee. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of hopscotching back and forth or, or a leapfrogging over some of the issues. If we only did civic work, I think it'd be really difficult mm -hmm. to maintain some continuity and some balance and reduce the, the fluctuation in the office size and the you know. Do you find you're able to keep your office size pretty consistent, given that? Yeah. What yeah. is your office size typically? Well, right now it's pretty small. It's like four people. Mm -hmm. um, is that but since two, I mean, 2008 well? was definitely a, mm -hmm. a moment of turning. <laughs> <laughs> Increased networking. <laughs> yeah, there was more time. And actually, it's interesting time. because um, during that period, which I still feel that architects are still facing, even though, of course, the signs are, um, indicators are that things are on the upswing. Um, what we found was also that we were working more on master plans because people were trying to gather their kind of head of steam um, for when they would come out and emerge from the <laughs> horrible depths of the recession. And so um, we found that we were producing projects that are much more in the realm of that kind of planning uh, thinking, which again is, that's not foreign to us because that's the kind of thinking that we've had to do for these other very long projects. So it's, it's been okay for us. Um, but I think that, uh, that you know, we, we, don't, we don't imagine, you know, Amanda, you and I were talking about how practices, some practices are enormous. The ones that we know of that started with, you know, 10 people are now like over 100 or 200 or Chipperfield's office at 400 people. Um, I guess James and I feel that um, we like to be very personally close to the work, and um, that requires a certain kind of um, rhythmical, um, very deliberate idea about size and capacity. And um, we have found that we really enjoy, you know, a, a, the size of practice that was like that's operating at about twelve people. Like that feels very good to us, um, and um, so in in our minds. You know, even when we were at 16, sometimes that felt a little too large. Um, so there, I think there is a kind of a kind of sweet spot. Last question, I think. Same thing. Oh yes, great. Yeah, um, I was just curious for the um, for the bridge project with all those R installations that kind of took life after the project. Uh, how did those come? Did those come about more as you guys reaching out to them? Because I know you talk a lot about. Um, how involved you are with the community? Is that you guys reaching out to them, or do they kind of find their way into it? So that's a that's an excellent question, and that's a really really important one. Um, in those cases, because this is one of the truly truly public spaces in in Milwaukee, in that it doesn't is not sort of secretly and surreptitiously privately owned by some other, uh, like the Performing Arts Center has a beautiful garden, but it's technically the Performing Arts Center's public garden. Um, so this is truly a public space in that, and so all you need is a permit that you can get from the city and you can perform there. So that's pretty interesting. So at the moment, all of those, those artistic efforts have basically been self-initiated. Having said that, I don't think that's the best plan. Um, 
I've been studying the way in which the High Line and Robert Hammond in particular, who um, is the uh, executive director of the Friends of the High Line, the way in which he's been able to raise capital um, to both maintain the High Line, but, but more importantly, to program it in a regular way. So since, 2000, um, since, since 2008 or 2009, they've had over 2,000 programming efforts, everything from art installations to public performances to educational outreach. They've really used the space of the High Line um, very effectively. And I think that the, the kind of boost that comes from a Friends of the High Line entity, like we need a Friends of the Marsupial Bridge, or we need a friend, you know, we need that kind of, of structure. You need Diane von Furstenberg or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I think that that would be really, really helpful because the, the, the flip side to it being a very public space is that it's also, um, it can also flip into into um, into a chaotic space quite immediately. It could also, you know, at the same time that it's public, the dark underbelly of it being public is that nobody would care for it, and um, and it would become dilapidated, and or it would be overtaken by single use. You know, for example, someone decides that they would that they would um, position something there and then just squat themselves there in that particular program, you know, for seven months. Like, so it's a very tricky. Tricky, tricky balance to achieve, and so I believe that that's that's a mistake in in terms of the strategy for this this space. If we if we had had something like the High Line precede this project, I think we would have had a little bit more of a roadmap to see how we could continually program it, in, you know, in a steady diet. So now it's a little bit sporadic in terms of how who uses it and how. And I mean, it's still quite regular. A play was just performed there recently, so it's still being used regularly. But I think it could be. It, it, it could definitely be energized. It's a very good question. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me.